It's 7 o'clock. Is everyone ready to begin? Yep. Yes. Um, we are. Then I'll call this meeting of the Yellow Springs Planning Commission to order. Rudy, would you like to take the roll, please? I would. Reed. Here. Sims. Here. Stiles. Here. Pelzell. Here. Zerbukin. Here. Thank also, you. I'm sorry, also present is Planner Denise Swinger and Village Solicitor Chris Connard. Okay, so we have an agenda in front of us. Uh, we have a bunch of public hearings uh, that are related to the uh, text amendments regarding the uh, short-term rental language. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we'll not be considering anything with respect to the CBE tonight. Um, that has been dropped off the agenda. Uh, any questions on the agenda? If not, we have Judy's minutes from the last meeting. Um, anyone have any questions or comments on the first page? I do. I guess I have a question that doesn't necessarily have with the minutes, but I know that Adam no longer lives here. He lives in Florida. Yes. So are we removing him then as an absent member, or do you continue him as an absent? Well, I was sort of keeping him there until we had that position replaced, but okay. we can just make him go away okay. if you prefer. Isn't there like an attendance um, yeah. policy yeah. anyway, and he's yeah. missed enough meetings yeah. that he's sort of automatically not? Right. Yeah, Correct. unfortunately, I have no address to, to notify. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Okay, uh, page two. Um, I just had one. Uh, uh, John Harple Road. Uh, there was, it said Harper, after halfway down, Harper opined that the lots were to be combined. It's Harple Road. Where are what page, you on? Two? On page two, halfway down, um, third line after we close the public hearing. It's a second sentence in the yeah. Paragraph John, starts. Yeah, John okay. Got it. Uh, I have one comment, Judy, on the uh, Jim Mayer. Jim has not built yet. Um, I think one, two, three, four from the bottom. He plans to. Okay, yes. Then. Got it. Anything else, page two? Mm -hmm. Page three. Page four. Five. Six. Or seven. Thanks, Judy, for distilling a painfully long meeting. Yeah. Uh, do we have a motion to accept these as amended? So move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Thank you. Okay. The uh, next item on the agenda is communications. Uh, Chris sent us. Uh, some things regarding complete streets. Chris, do you want to give us a five minute? How about a one minute? Okay. <laughs> we'll do that. Um, the uh, It was a workshop that uh, was presented by Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission on complete streets. And as you read the handouts, they go down and then up to the next column. Don't They don't go across. Oh, okay. Just to uh, facilitate the um, information. It was a very good workshop, very informative about the different options and things to look at for streets, uh, sidewalks, bicycles. Um, we had the workshop and then we did a walk on um, Dayton Street and some did a walk on Xenia Avenue looking at obstructions, improvements that could be done. Um, there was a lady in a motorized wheelchair with uh, my group that was going up uh, Dayton Street and it was very eye-opening to see the hazards and the in, uh, obstructions that she has to deal with. So that was informative just to have her be part of the company. Mm -hmm. um, 
I understand that Village Council was going to uh, have this again, or they already did? Uh, there is a complete streets presentation scheduled for, I believe it's October 16th, and they're allotting about half an hour for it, so it should be pretty comprehensive. Miami Valley Planning Commission will again come and present that. It was very informative, uh, uh, good information, uh, things to look at as far as looking at streets. And uh, one of the presenters, uh, as we came back to um, the Bryan Center, uh, looked at Dayton Street as far as how wide that is and how uh, much traffic that comes in and how there's a couple areas where um, there's a left-hand turn into the residences, like into King Street or into, um, oh, I um, can't think of uh, the little neighborhood, the pocket neighborhood, Park Meadows. And, and so her suggestion it was a, a plan that they put into place in Dayton on a very busy thoroughfare in Dayton. Uh, to kind of make one side, uh, kind of do a slalom approach to the traffic so that there would be parking on one side, two lanes of traffic plus a turn lane uh, for those particular streets that needed it. So it, it was a suggestion put out that was, it was a very good workshop. I enjoyed it, very informative. All right, thanks. That was more than a minute. It was one minute. Nah, you know, give me a stage. <laughs> Okay, the next item on the agenda is the council report. Jerry, do you have anything? Uh, <coughs> I'm going to report on just one, uh, and I'll let uh, Denise do the other. Uh, council will be looking at a uh, resolution, I believe, now, for uh, no smoking on all village owned properties. So we'll be taking that in discussion. Inside and out. Inside, yeah. And, and more focused but really on outside. Mm -hmm. So is smoking That's permitted right now inside? No, no. no. Okay. We're talking about parks and other villages oh, online. Okay. okay. Uh, mainly, mainly Gaunt Park was the, the big one, but mm -hmm. also outside. The buildings. Mm -hmm. Are you so, also talking about um, a uh, like a closing times for the park? Because there is no ordinance about the parks closing at dark. So my mm, suggestion that, is, no, that, if, you know, if you're talking about that, park um, regulation. No, just talking about smoking. Okay. At, at this time, probably leave that up to the next council. Okay. <laughs> Denise, the other issue that which uh, the short term yeah uh, well the the uh, council passed the uh, lodging tax ordinance and so therefore they've requested that planning commission uh, look at the um, legislation uh, relating to short term rentals and Chris Connor is here tonight um, with uh, the legislation that council is interested in having. Um, Planning Commission review. Uh, I know we've worked, looked at that before, so a lot of it was um, taken from the same. So we're going to do that. That's it. Okay. We're doing that tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Where is that on our agenda, Denise? Under two. Oh. All of those things. All of all of those yeah, yeah, things. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the um, uh, next item on the agenda is citizens comments. This is if uh, anybody out here has anything to say about something that's not on the agenda. Uh, if it's on the agenda, there will be um, a public hearing where you can come up and, and address the uh, um, commission. Uh, so if there's something that's, uh, again, not on the agenda that you'd like to speak about, this is your opportunity. And if not, then we'll move on. Um, well, I have a question. Yes. Uh, can, you, can you come up to the mic? And state your name, please. Uh, my name is Steve Vianovich. I live here in Yelp Springs on Birch Street. I had a quick question about uh, infill uh, lots. And, and uh, mm -hmm. is that something that, you know, I'm 
sorry, I'm kind of fresh on this, but is that something that in general is being promoted or? Uh, you mean like just a vacant lot that currently exists? Yeah, it's kind of blocked in by everybody else, but um, I think I can get the 40 foot, which I need for zoning, it's an RC. Uh, to uh, get back to it. And it's not in the village right now? It is, yeah. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, so it should already be zoned as something. It is, but I, I don't have that uh, line that uh, the, yeah. connects it to the road yet. The issue is but it's I, landlocked and you yeah. are required to have frontage right. uh, from the street and if, if but you have to have that also on the on what would be what would normally have been the frontage on that lot. Right, yeah. yeah. So is that a zoning appeals? Deal? Uh, well, we haven't talked about what his options are yet. Mm -hmm. So if he explores those options and those don't pan out, then I, it's possible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sure. Well, I, I just, it was just a point. Because I, I think that even though it, it doesn't fit the code, I think the council and, and we've been trying to encourage people to build infill. So That's what I wanted to know. Okay. And so I think okay. that you probably find a way to make that happen. Oh, okay. Okay. That was, that was Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Any other citizens' comments? Okay. Well, if that's the case, then we'll move on to the public hearings. I have a question. On the uh, packet that we received, there was the Pocket Neighborhood Development, uh, Chapter 1258, that uh, Denise uh, suggested that we uh, have part of our consent agenda. No, it'll be on Council's consent agenda for the first reading. Okay, is this on our agenda? Yeah, this has to be a public hearing. Yeah, I noticed okay. it in the paper. I as was a confused as well. Okay, I, I had assumed that. Uh, it does say consent yes. agenda item mm -hmm. for council. Oh, okay. for council. That's, yep. yeah. That's assuming that we pass it tonight. Okay. I see. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so we have a bunch of, uh, of individual public hearings with respect to um, text amendments, but to begin with, we have this chapter 12, 5801. Uh, which is the pocket neighborhood developments. Uh, Denise, do you want to start? Sure, yeah. Um, chapter, uh, earlier we had um, looked at all of the different chapters that were affected by pocket neighborhood developments and 124802 was specific to residential districts and you passed that as well as council. Um, this was overlooked and what this is, is really a just uh, the schedule of district uses combined. So it's basically what you already passed in, in 1248 under residential, putting uh, pocket neighborhood developments in A, B, and C. This 125801 is a table taking all the residential districts and the conservation and business and industrial on one um, big district's a use log or table. And so um, it was just omitted and we just need to put it in there. It just says that pocket neighborhood developments are conditional in RA, RB, and RC. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. What is that? One, two, three, four, page five. And then it has a sort of reference number to where we talk about pocket neighborhoods, right? Yes. Okay. What does it mean they're conditional? It means that um, uh, if you have a plan to develop a pocket neighborhood, that you have to actually have a public hearing. You have to come to planning commission and and notify the surrounding land property owners and uh, beforehand so that they're all aware of it. Uh, so if they have any issues or concerns, they can raise those in in that meeting or prior to it. And uh, and there are uh, conditions that are set. And, that's right. Specifically, and that condition can yeah. set conditions on that development in, in hopes to maybe addressing some of those issues that the surrounding folks may have. But it's a, it's, it's a public process as opposed to just setbacks and requirements defined by the code. And as long as you check all those boxes, you can go ahead and do that kind of development without a hearing. Um, but because it's conditional use, you have to have the hearing. Okay, so. Um, any questions for Denise on this change to this table? 
If not, then um, this is a public hearing, so we will open the public hearing. You could have asked your question then, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, if you have a question about this table, this change, uh, this is your opportunity. And if you don't, then we'll close the public hearing. And um, any further discussion? Um, I, you may have a question there, I'm sorry. Um, what is the, remind me what the status is right now on the, what we've already passed, is it, has it been? It's gone through the second reading. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's finished. In the second reading. Yes. Okay. Um, so in 30 days from September 18th, it is. Okay, cool. Right. Thanks. So this is just cleanup of mm -hmm. yeah. other, other nice yeah. links. Just adding in a uh, reference. Pretty much. Yeah, I don't know how I missed that. <laughs> You're terrible, that's how. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. okay, if there's no more questions, do we have a motion to accept the change in Chapter 1258, Section 01? I move to approve. I second. Judy, you want to take the roll? Your side. Is Rukin? Yes. Pulsell? Yes. Stiles? Yes. Sims? Yes. Reed? Yes. Okay, so the uh, next public hearing, we need to do these singularly, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Uh, text amendments. And the first is to amend Chapter 126208. This is uh, regarding the short term rental language. Sure. Denise, yes. do you want to? Uh... Um, sure. Um, at the September 5th meeting of council, they passed the um, lodging tax ordinance. Um, so uh, they wanted the tax to include rentals of properties um, for fewer than 30 days. Um, because of that lodging tax, um, councils asked Planning Commission to go, they want to reconsider now that short-term rentals, um, clean up the language as well to match um, transient guest lodging. And um, uh, Chris has been so kind as to take um, all those affected pieces of the ordinances that relate to short-term rentals and to um, redefine them as transit guest lodging and then adding some additional information about that. And I guess we can just take it one by one. Chris, if you have any. Uh, yeah, I, first uh, I'd like to thank Planning Commission because I know you had long discussions about this. Um, under the uh, zoning code, the terminology short-term <coughs> rental was used and it had a unique definition that was unique to the village. Um, under the uh, Ohio Revised Code, the term that is used is transient guest lodging establishment. So we felt that it would be more consistent uh, to mirror the language within the Ohio Revised Code to avoid confusion. And since we were adopting a different definition to leave short-term rental in would add another layer of confusion. So this is all designed to simply have consistency um, and clarity within the zoning code then that mirrors what's in the state code by way of definitions and what will ultimately be in the codified ordinances effective uh, January 1, 2018. So all of the changes save one uh, on the conditional uh, piece of things, which when we get there, Denise will do an introduction and I may comment as well, are only um, text amendments for uh, definitional purposes so that we have parallel structure between all the code sections that are relevant. Okay. So is it council's intent then to apply this tax to the transient guest lodging establishments? Yes, that, that's, that's what the lodging tax is. So the, the way I, I think short term rental was defined as uh, 15 days. It was, it was defined um, 30, um, um, at least a month or two weeks, a month, or but less than a year is how okay. it used to be. And then we wanted it to be less than 30 days. And so the council approved the lodging tax with uh, a, uh, that if one is in the business five days or less, they don't have to pay the tax. Um, and I think that what was the other one. And that, is that, that's in a calendar year? That's a calendar, yeah. 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 Uh, and I think that that was it. I think that was it. Yeah, yeah. Five, five days over the year, they don't have to, if they're renting out a, this transient 
guest lodging only five days or less a year. There's no um, lodging tax. But if it's what if it's what if it's 60 days? What what's the term? What is the length of the stay? If, they're, if they are operating a transient guest lodging establishment, which means uh, they are uh, renting a, a room in their house or their accessory dwelling uh, more than five days a year, then they would be step in, that individual would be subject to uh, collecting the lodging tax. The obligation to pay the lodging tax is upon the guest. What if it was like a full apartment and they're renting it for two months at a time? If it were a two month rental mm -hmm. to the same person or yeah. people, that would fall outside of the transient guest because it's more than 30 days. Okay, so more than 30 days is not to transient. an individual. To an individual. Yes. Sort of what we had talked about for, at some length about, you okay. know, um, once you hit 30 days, then you, there are lots of times that people have month to month. Yes. Yeah, and we don't really want to regulate that. Okay. Even in someone's home or just for an apartment? If it's more than 30 days, if it's then the lodging tax does not apply. Correct. Just to be clear. Correct. Okay. And I, I might add as well that um, uh, that uh, Melissa uh, Dodd is we're creating an FAQ for frequently asked questions so that we've got this a couple months to roll this out to make sure that people understand sure. how the tax will work. Yeah. That was the reason why the effective date of January 1 uh, was adopted. Any other questions for Chris? Yes, so what is the status then if, if a tenant is uh, a guest is staying for over 30 days, there's no lodging tax Correct. charged? Then it's a rental. Uh, yeah. A short term rental. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so um, in this, there's some specific language that was, that was added with respect to utilities and parking. And, and the standards for which the there will, but I think if we, we would if we go through each one that we can get to the one on conditions and talk about okay. that. Unless you want to do it now. Okay. Well, um, where are we? We're at. Uh, we usually take the oh, actually, day that is one the first. first. Yeah, we're, we usually okay, take we're, the day okay. one and get through it. And okay, I'm sorry. I would have looked at that. Um, all right. So on the conditional use, uh, the. Uh, the short-term rental was a conditional use. Um, so we're changing the definition. The, uh, the issue that we felt needed to be addressed was that there were no standards under conditional use. And in the absence of standards, there's a lack of clarity. There's no guidance to the Planning Commission. And uh, so we felt that it was important to put some standards in there uh, that allow those individuals who are seeking a permit to operate a transient guest lodging establishment to know what they needed to consider when applying for the permit. Mm -hmm. And then equally important would be for uh, the Planning Commission in the role of its quasi-judicial function to uh, determine whether or not uh, it was appropriate to grant that conditional use permit uh, to put those standards in there for them as well. And right now we're talking about 1262.08 specific requirements under H. Uh, yeah, H. Six. Yeah, six. six. And then six. He's, he's referring to H. H. Six H, yeah. Okay. Yep. I just, I see that. Which is something I really like to see in there, actually, to have that standards to it that we can equally consider for each applicant that comes forward that goes beyond just asking, well, as you know, <coughs> previously there wasn't anything in there other than emergency contact information. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, and, and the location. So this, this, this gives actually the, they took out the emer emergency contact. Do these items. come from somewhere else? Mm -hmm. it's where did they come from? Um, Another community? The standards are somewhat used um, by the Board of Zoning Appeals oh, okay. in making their determinations. And then it's also um, 
uh, sort of a uh, kind of not from the land use planning comprehensive land use plan but the visioning it's it's uh, goals that the community had sure what number three whether the conditional use will have a negative impact on affordable housing or whether decreased potential income tax from the, the village would collect. I'm, I'm trying to draw a reference to, to that as it relates to transit guest lodging. It, well, the, the concept there is that if someone is, if, if <laughs> I'll use an extreme example, let's say 90% of the village decided that they were going to engage in transient guest lodging establishments. No one would live here long enough to collect any income tax. And so if there were a, a density, uh, too much of a density of transient guest lodging somewhere, that might be a factor that would be relevant to at least consider and discuss. Um, do I think that it would happen? Practically speaking, no. But there, when you start talking about uh, impact on the tax base, that becomes an important consideration uh, for uh, the government entity to consider. Yeah, um, this gives planning commission some direction to what right. the impact could be and what to consider. It gives us some direction, but I do have to say, I think most of them are fairly subjective. Yes. And that always, I think, makes it a little difficult. Mm -hmm. It's nice when it is objective, so we can be pretty consistent in how we uh, review every situation. Yeah. Well, and that's why it's conditional use, is because every, yeah. conditions, every case is not the same. Yes, I understand. I mean, that's the thing. There might be already four homes on the block that are being rented, yeah. and at some point, five years from now, someone planning commission says that's enough for that neighborhood. So is this in perpetuity, um, that unit has the condition no use allowed on it? Well, certainly, someone if a if a home were sold, and someone wanted to live in it, then it changes. yeah. Change but would the they use. need to reapply for a conditional use if they wanted to use it in the same way? I, I don't think so. If okay. That's the reason why they're they're acquiring the property. Or if it wasn't the reason they were, but it turned into the reason that they wanted, you know, they could use it that way. If they would have to update if they, their... If the, if the use ceased mm -hmm. for a, a period of time, certainly six months, that then a, and the village found out about it, they could step in and say that you need to get a permit for that. Okay. There, there, is, there is a concept of abandonment of use. Okay, what about um, uh, current existing um, properties that are doing this now? What Their status would be grandfathered. Their status would be grandfathered, but they would still need to pay the lodging tax. Yes. So how would we know that they need to pay the lodging tax? Well, that's part of the process of rolling it out with the FAQ. I, one of the things that happened in the, and staff looked into this extensively, um, Patty uh, Bates spoke with a manager, I, I think in Ottawa County, and the biggest issue that, that they had for uh, enforcement was that many property owners didn't realize the tax existed. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a question of people are actively avoiding the payment of the tax. It's not tax evasion. It's yeah. simply lack of knowledge that there's this rule that you need to follow. Mm -hmm. So by grandfathering it, you're saying that they don't have to apply for a conditional use if they're Correct. already operating. Correct. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they have to, though, provide the contact information? Because it, that's a requirement of an that emergency be, contact. Yeah, and, and that, while that will happen by definition with the permitting process, I would expect that the FAQ would be part of saying we would like this information okay. as part of it. Yeah, if you're already doing it, you don't need to get a conditional use, but we would like the information. But that also might be a reason if a property is sold, that you need now to gather that information again. Who is your emergency contact? You know, you were saying, well, you wouldn't have to apply for a conditional permit use, but that might be a reason that actually 
if it, if it changed, if it sold, mm -hmm. that you might want it to so that you can gather that information again. I think that's a fair point. Would you not cover that in the contact for paying the taxes? I mean, it seems that you could cover that piece in how the person is to contact you to pay their And that's somewhere else. Taxes. Right. I'm just asking that Where question. is that? Like, that, that, is that a state? Where is that legislation? Yeah, what are we talking about the registration or the reporting? Because that that is in the substantive part of the ordinance is where the application where it Council, references yeah. the application okay. permit. Okay. And and that permit is being designed by the finance department to make sure that they it captures the information that they deem necessary to administer the program. Is that the same sort of database that this is talking about? When it's when you say this, what do you do? I guess it's not talking about I mean, this is for the conditional use. Yeah, I know, but so we haven't said anything about um, like keeping. I guess it would be included in the conditional use that we would keep on file their information. Right. Yes. information. I would expect it's that there right would be two tabs here. Two oh, here. Okay, permit. Okay, it's under A. Name emergency call. Okay. Okay. And that probably needs to be modified then to include change in ownership or something like that. Well, I would think that there would be some way. I mean, every community has something that indicates that there's been a change in ownership because we have utilities, we have other right. mechanisms, and right. so would I would expect that. the finance department to be able to capture that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We just have to update the conditional use as well. Hopefully. Yes. Mm -hmm. If they're being kept separately, the information, you know. I mean, do you want to add something into that section that says any change in ownership will be conveyed to the Village of Yellow Springs as a part of the permitting process? Or owner, not I mean, even ownership or contact information. I mean, like, contact information can change. The, that person can move to a different place. Mm -hmm. And you the know. question is, do you want it here or do you want it in, you know, which where yeah. you want that? I want it both places. Located. Both places. I want it here too. No, in terms of legality, where do you want that condition located? The, the, the ordinances themselves allow for the finance director to create administrative regulations and rules to make the program functional. Um, okay. I haven't fully thought out your question because I'm hearing it now and processing it. But my gut reaction is I think that that's something just to allow the finance director to deal with in the context of implementing and collecting the tax because there's going to be a set of rules of here's what you need to do. Okay, that makes sense. I think to me, um, well, it's definitely a valid question though. As long as the zoning administrator has that, because that's who this person is submitting to. Well, except once the conditional use is achieved, then the zoning administrator doesn't really have Unless the contact, I mean, like, why are I'm we? I'm saying at that point, then, it's, then it goes to the finance folks, the people who are collecting the yeah. tax. Yeah. And Denise is not the one collecting that tax. But, but this is, but there's two separate ideas here. There's the conditional use, mm -hmm. and there's the tax. And if we're I guess if Denise is able to access the information about that person from the finance director, like I guess I would just like our conditional use permits to be up to date if we're doing this thing. I don't know. I guess like maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it, you can convince me that it doesn't matter. It does matter. I, okay. I, I, I think we, we. If we're asking for the contact information here, then we're asking for it to be updated. The, if the, if we don't need it, if the finance director is going to get it, then we don't need it. The, well, it, it needs to be given when the, the permit is okay. being considered by okay. planning commission. Right. Okay. The obligation to update change of, oh, not ownership because that's a whole different issue, yeah. but the change of contact person, Yeah. that really is, it seems to me, a, a function of what the zoning, or pardon me, the finance 
department would do um, okay. and the way it would handle a utility bill. Sure. Okay. As, yeah, as long as that's required there, then we don't need to. Under the H standards number three, I, I kind of agree with comment Susan made. It's um, we're looking at an economic impact, and it's very uh, subjective. I mean, it's um, for planning to commission to decide yay or nay on a conditional use um, as to whether uh, affordable housing is being impacted. Um, I'm having a hard time with that particular phrasing. Well, it, it, it simply is one factor among the four, uh, and the weight that it's given depends on what the circumstances are. Um, one of the things that uh, we discovered is that um, the Airbnb transient guest lodging in some communities has had an impact on affordable housing mm -hmm. because of what mm -hmm. people can make. Um, and, um, and so there are communities that have had limitations on uh, the number of days one can even operate the business. And they go, they run the gamut. I mean, some cities have these enforcement procedures that could never be enforced, which says once mm -hmm. you do it beyond six months, you have to report that you've done it beyond six months and you can't do it anymore. Um, then there's other communities that attempt to be a little more vigorous in how they might enforce it. Um, I think that part of the mindset that, um, that staff had uh, and that what we talked about was this is a new endeavor. Uh, let, let's let's approach it, deal with situations as they come up, because we don't know exactly what we're dealing with. In a broad sense, given the fact that Yellow Springs is a destination community, the citizens here are, I think, uh, generally would agree, or at least there's enough of a sentiment, sentiment, that you're paying for the services of guests coming and enjoying this town some of that burden should be shifted to those who stay here. And uh, we're mindful that any time you undertake something like this, even though lodging taxes have been in existence for decades and all of us have paid them, <laughs> um, we don't want to create a situation that has an unintended consequence. So let's be deliberate and see how it's implemented. We had a period of comment both within the context of the council meeting, after the council meeting when the lodging tax was concept was introduced, staff was contacted by people who had concerns. We did have a couple tweaks in the final draft that was approved by council. And uh, so I think this is all in line with the continuation of a thoughtful process to roll this out. Could we change, uh, have the wording of what the condition, if whether the conditional use would negatively impact, uh, neg have a negative economic impact, and let the rest of the wording go. Have a negative economic, economic impact. Because well, that's I'm so sure. vague. That sounds vague. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. more vague, vague than that. <clears throat> and I, mean, on, I think the purpose of this in here is if you have a, a, a lot of small little homes that could be more affordable, mm -hmm. and those are suddenly being turned into oh, a whole row of Airbnb. Airbnbs, that's something, it, ha having it in here, it's just another uh, tool for us to consider that. Yeah. On, oh wow, that street, you know, has only has six smaller homes and four of them are already being used as Airbnb. Can you explain number four then? I think that the idea here is is that there's general principles in the in, in the, exist within the rights of property ownership, and uh, I think we all recognize now. But at the time, back in the, 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 the turn of the 19th century, uh, probably 20th century, that there people wanted to be able to use their property in any way they saw fit. And in fact, uh, when you look at what happened in Houston with Hurricane Harvey, where they have no zoning at all, you can have a, a sexually oriented business next to a daycare there. Um, and because there was no planning, uh, there's a broad consensus that, that the damage to that happened to that city was more severe because of that lack of planning. 
So when we talk about the spirit and intent of the zoning requirements, mm -hmm. I, I think that there is a community standard that exists within Yellow Springs, whatever that might be. And I, it is absolutely subjective in some ways, but the, the idea here is, is that this is a continue, conditional use, that uh, barring some reasons not to allow it, they typically a conditional use is just more often than not granted. And um, I think that uh, when you consider how the Planning Commission has always worked here, I think that the Planning Commission in Yellow Springs has always tried to find a way to work with a property owner to accomplish the goal and balance the interests of the community with what the property owner wants to do. Okay. And I think it just simply spells out that that's a stated goal. Um, are you We're going to have open the floor up oh, okay. here in a, in a minute. <clears throat> and under number C, max, maximum occupancy, we've added the uh, that there be no more than two adults shall occupy the ADU. And I know we've discussed this in the past, and I'm thinking that we shouldn't possibly strike that because there may quite possibly be an accessory dwelling unit uh, above a, a garage, for example, that has a bedroom plus a futon. So you've got three adults possibly staying there. I would just say uh, stay with the maximum number of tenants permitted uh, applicable by the health department requirements and strike the, strike the county zoning. No, it says applicable health department. Health department. I, I know that's what a requirement that we have for people that are living long term in a rental accessory dwelling unit. Is maximum of two. Two adults. Mm -hmm. So you could have you children, children too. Mm -hmm. But it's two adults. It does seem uh, to negatively impact affordable housing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm in favor of striking it. Well, if we change it here, then we have to change the accessory dwelling language as well. And well, we, we went around and around. around well, it's because we're referencing specifically accessory dwellings. The transient guest mm -hmm. lodging located in an accessory dwelling unit. Oh. So you try to make it fit the ADU language. Right. And we talked about that for yeah, months. I don't want to change it. So I'd rather, I I'd rather not change it on the spur of the moment. If we want to change it, we can continue this and think about it for a month. Um, but That was specific to accessory dwelling units. Yeah. 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 I don't want to change it on the spur of the moment and then I agree. have to okay. plow through the rest of the code. Um, can we add mm -hmm. something in that specifies how someone would prove that they're a... Uh, um, whatever this is called, transient guest lodging is a uh, grandfathered in, like, to, like some documentation that they were, you, you know, so that, so that that's clear, you know, they show you or they show, I, I don't know, like a real way for them to get out of doing this so that. The there is staff has a list of properties that they believe uh, the owners are. Some of them are known already. I mean, there's advertising going on on Airbnb. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a pretty good online. there's a pretty good sense of what's out there. But I also think that as part of this rollout, uh, and again, we've got till January 1st and the FAQ and all of that. If somebody wants to contend that they are a grandfathered use, uh, they ought to do it now rather than wait till after January 1. Because if they operate a lot, transient guest lodging um, and it's discovered because they haven't registered and they want to contend there's a grandfathered use, they, they're going to have to have some evidence to establish that. How, how would that? Who, who would decide whether or not it's grandfathered in? Well, Denise? Yeah, no, not Denise necessarily, although I'm sure that her voice would have some weight. But we, that's part of the administrative code regu that uh, Melissa is handling is through the finance department. But based on whether or not they have to have a conditional use. Sorry. Pardon me? Based on whether, I'm trying to, like, what, if you're saying, I, I guess I'm, I'm unclear, like, 
Whether or not they're grandfathered in, all of that stuff applies to them. This is what doesn't apply to them if they're grandfathered in. So this is what they're trying to, a conditional use hearing is what someone would be making a decision on. What else, what, who are you talking about who would decide whether or not they're grandfathered in for what purpose? So that they don't have to go through a conditional use hearing. Who would decide that? That's, that would happen through the finance director, what I would expect with some input from, from Denise. It just depends on what the circumstances are. But keep in mind, they have to register for the tax. Yeah. And, I, and I would expect that, there, that uh, while we have dates, and I can't remember off the top of my head that I think that, um, uh, that the registration period will probably open in January, but it could open before then. So yeah. that, we're, that we're ready to roll it out on January 1st. I'm pretty confident that we'll be able to capture who uh, grandfather use, uh, who's engaged in grandfather use. Okay. And so the idea, if, you, if you register January of 2018, you're probably already engaged in this activity. You've submitted your information for the contact information and whatnot. Okay. So well, and one of the ways that I think staff had spoken about giving that indication that you have been operational is by having receipts. So it sort of plays back into that finance director role. Okay, in a, in a, so if someone, let's say in February, hasn't been paying the tax for a month, or they start paying the tax, they, you know, they're like, we, we haven't been doing this for two months, it's January, February, March, right? But we, we were doing it in 2017, do they still need to do the conditional use or do they not? That would no. depend on whether or not the finance director can establish that they are grandfathered in. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, can we put that the finance? Can we put that in here? That it, the finance. It's already been done. Yeah. It, it's already been done through the legislation itself. Okay. All, all I wish we the, had that. Yeah. I mean, this is <laughs> this is just the zoning code. Yeah. No, I know, but the the whether or not they're grandfathered in applies directly to the zoning code, not to the well, ordinance. It, it, it doesn't in that the only people this applies to are people who are not grandfathered in. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but there, there's, if you work in this building, yeah. there's a continual interplay between okay. zoning code and administrative code. There's a continual of course. line of communication yeah, yeah, yeah. that occurs. It seems odd sitting at this table to say, but wait, we need to make sure that everything is yeah. in here that needs to be. Yeah. But. But there is that interplay that assures that there, something doesn't fall completely through the cracks. And I hear what you're saying. Your concern's totally valid. I think for you know Denise or myself sitting, we're going. But wait, no, we already catched that. Yeah. But that's not clear to you. So is is this particular? Is this? If we approve this now, does this not go into effect until January first as well? Th this would be this. The zoning code amendments would uh, take effect at the time at the natural operation of council 30 days after yeah. the, the okay. second reading. They they don't become relevant until January 1st as it pertains to lodging and the lodging tax. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't care about the lodging tax. I care about the conditional use. But it's okay. I get what you're saying. It's fine. I, it won't actually be necessary until January 1st, right. I get it. I, I had a question, just a theoretical question for Planning Commission about, you had asked some questions about number three and about number four. Mm -hmm. And I guess as I look at them and hear Chris's explanation of number four, I wonder if number four ex makes number three irrelevant. And, and in fact, by stating number three, whether that puts, um, a political pressure on planning commission that maybe does not need to be there. Um, that's my theoretical question for you. Well, I can speak to that a little bit. I know one of the issues I've had with this type of rental is that it is taking affordable houses off the off the market for long-term um, rental or sale, which affects schools, it affects income tax, it affects all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, it was, I always thought it was, it was diametrically opposite of our effort to, to try to support affordable housing through village funds, through 
um, you know, free utility hookups, all that kind of stuff, to then, on the other side of the same coin, just allow affordable housing to be taken off the market to be used as short-term rentals. And so I, I, I thought that was acting as a negative for us as a village, as a whole. And even though that's tough to balance with, with folks who are trying to main, remain in town because it is becoming unaffordable by renting out yeah. either you know, a room above their garage or in their house. And so, and so I think you're trying to kind of thread a needle here that, that supports affordable housing but also supports folks who are trying to stay in town and make a little money on the side so that they can they can pay their taxes, you know, for the fire station and the new water plant and everything else that we're spending money on. So I guess, it, I mean, philosophically, that was a conversation I've had with a number of people. And, uh, and where is that sweet spot? How do you find a spot where you're supporting affordable housing but also supporting people's ability to, to, to make some money to, to be able to, to stay here in, in town? Well, I would not want to drop three and just leave in four because I think three actually specifies about affordable housing where I think four is, is much more um, just open and subjective. So I, I like having three. Um, I, I don't, you know, I, I think that they're not as objective as I'd like, but I think that they're fine. You know, they're part of the having to consider each, each situation. I mean, at one time I was actually thinking that we should say something like, um, if you rent a house more than, or you can't, um, have trust transient guest lodging for more than 90 days out of the year. So if somebody could leave for the summer and rent their house out, but, but I mean, this really just, it doesn't say anything about taking an affordable home off the, out of the housing market. It just says the planning commission can consider it as a factor when granting the conditional yeah, use. To look at the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. well, I, you, well, you're looking more than just at neighborhoods. Because our neighborhoods aren't, you know, the village as a whole is not that big. Yeah. So we're, we're really, every time we look at this, we're really taking the whole village in, mm -hmm. you know, because when you, when you take out the industry and the downtown and so forth and, and the education, it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A, it's not a big area left. And I think there's um, something to be said about whether it's owner occupied or whether it's not. So can, can we can we take a pause and open a public hearing? Yes. So yes. We can yes. Sorry. Can, can I sit here very patiently? Yeah. Can, can I ask Please. one quick question before time. we do that? In in A, we well right above this, we we changed the term short term rental to uh, transit guest lodging, but in in the tax under A, uh, we we still have short term rentals. Where? The second sentence, take a line. Uh, yeah, right here. Should, uh, should that, okay, should that okay. be changed? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, I see it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's a mistake. Okay, now you can go on. Okay, <laughs> okay let's take a pause and let's open the public hearing. So if you want to address this, come to the podium, identify yourself for all the folks watching on Channel 5, because it's a huge crowd. Yeah. It's just like in here. <laughs> I really didn't, I wasn't Can sure you what you your name, please? Oh, my name is Leslie Shepard, and I live here in town. And um, I came here uh, mostly about the pocket idea because I live near where something like this might happen, and I hoped I would learn more about it. But, but this is interesting to me, too, because I was against the lodging tax. And as I'm listening to this, it's so big brother. It's like you all, uh, you know, are sitting here in the council. They're going to say whether or not somebody can rent a room in their house because it might impact what this group or the council group considers to be affordable. Well, if you have an expensive house that doesn't fall under somebody's subjective idea of affordable, you're allowed to do it. Well, that person that has a more expensive home theoretically doesn't need the income. Somebody with a less expensive property might be the one that needs that couple hundred a month or something like you say, because now we have this, we're going to have this tax and that tax and everything going up. But we're going to, you all are going to subjectively say, or the council, you have what we think is an affordable house, so you can't do it. 
I just don't like the whole tone of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's my objection. I don't own a rental property. I have no personal stake in it. But um, I just, I don't like it. So I'm just stating an objection. I, th I think the goal is not to, is, is to make sure those little homes don't get taken entirely off the market. Not that you can't rent it out for But if somebody months. owns it, it's their business what they mm -hmm. do with it. But it also That's what does, private property is. Right. But it also does impact the whole community. We're talking about places where like the owner doesn't live there. I know that. You know. I used to yeah. I used to have a rental property before I moved into it. Yeah. You know. But but, but the the impact that like, you know, someone coming for two days at a time. Right would have on a community and the inflow of people, you don't think that should be regulated at all? No, I don't think that should be regulated. I think too much is regulated. Mm -hmm. People own a property, it's their property. If they're not doing anything obnoxious and offensive and dangerous, they should be able to do with it whatever they want. It's their property. They bought it, they paid for it, they pay the taxes, they maintain it. It's their business. It's not some other group's business to say, your house is valued at X, Therefore, it falls under what we think is affordable. The whole problem with affordable housing in Yellow Spring, high taxes and no jobs for people. You get a whole town of people cobbling together part-time jobs because we've driven out everything or not allowed anything in. And I grew up here. I grew up here from 1953. I went all the way through school here. Then I lived somewhere else for 25 years in the real world. I came back for various reasons. I'm happy to be back, and I like various qualities of the village. But this micromanagement of you have a house, and this is our social goal, and you can't rent, and you can rent, and now we're going to tax you, and now we're going to do this, it's just incredible to me. And I think it just runs very counter to the freedom of our country, and if you have private property, you're not doing anything dangerous and obnoxious, you want to rent out a room, rent out a room. You probably need the money. Thanks. Well, I will say this doesn't preclude you from running out of room. Yes, but you're going to decide whether a property somebody owns is allowed to be a rental property. So That's what this is talking about. Am I mistaken? I'm not it's talking about <coughs> transient conditional right. conditional no, uses. Property. Conditional right. uses are permitted uses. Right. But it allows the planning commission to put conditions That's and that doesn't say you can't do it it theoretically you could say that that would be I, very rare it would have to be something pretty obnoxious okay. well, for it to be denied it yeah it would be that if if renting a certain property for whatever purpose takes it out of what some group defines as affordable then maybe that use would be granted but you'll let somebody else rent it because in your subjective opinion, mm -hmm. it's not in the affordable pool. Well, we, my understanding of, that. Of, of this terminology using the term um, affordable is not this property is affordable, that property is unaffordable. It's, it's talking about, I'm actually like most of the time really arguing to take out right, uh, restrictions on things that people can do. Um, and I guess this particular thing seems special to me because um, uh, because of the impact that it can have on a neighborhood. Like renting on a month to month is a community that's there that, that you know, there's lots of Airbnbs that are happening right now, right? Mm -hmm. And there is some issues that are happening, and this is really so that the the people who are being complained, you know, like, so that if there is an issue, we have access to information about who owns that property and who the emergency well, contact is. I appreciate is. what you're saying about that. I wasn't arguing about that. Yeah. I'm just saying about a group deciding whether you are allowed to do that because they say, well, this house, this property is 
affordable. And so, if you use it, then it takes it out of the affordable pool and somehow precludes people from living here. Well, conditional uses, like for example, um, what is it called when someone ha wants to run a business out of their organization? Home occupation. Home occupation. That's mm -hmm. conditionally allowed and separate in several different zones in Yellow Springs, right? Those people have to come to planning commission and their neighbors have to be... I understand you know, all that. I'm not talking about okay. that. I'm talking about the concept of someone deciding whether or not a person may rent, all other things being equal, may rent their property or not because somebody says, oh no, it will impact affordable. The way to get to affordable housing is to have lower taxes and jobs for people so they can afford to live here and allow people to build. And this village has spent decades trying to prevent that. Stymieing builders, suing them, not allowing things to happen, uh, running businesses out of town, you know, and so therefore you have so many people, it's so unfortunate the good jobs aren't here like they used to be and, you know, and so that's why there's a problem with affordable housing. There is a problem, I agree with that. But I don't think it can be micromanaged in this manner or by continuing to impose higher taxes or giveaways like no tap-in fees. All that does is lessen village income and then the village looks to other people, the same old people, over and over again to tap. We're working to tax you. You invested millions of dollars and put a beautiful hotel here. Well, let's here tax you more. You want to do an Airbnb. Well, let's tax you. You know, people who are trying to make money and trying to stay ahead in an increasingly unaffordable place are being penalized. So that's my point and thank you for clarifying. Thanks. It, it, it's open mic. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, anything else? Okay, um, I'll close the public hearing then. Okay. We have questions, anything else, comments for Denise? No. For Chris? Now this goes to council, right? Correct. For two readings? Yes. Okay. And we have a, a, a clerical error that we need to clean up that Jerry found. Mm -hmm. So has, is, has this public hearing been on all of two? No. Okay. Only the first one? Mm -hmm. Okay. So do you need a motion? Yes. Okay. If there's no other discussion and no changes, uh, do we have a motion to Yes, I, this? I, I would like to uh, make a motion to accept the amendment of Chapter 1262.08. With the typo being? Yes. Yeah. And we have a second? Second. Judy, you want to call the roll? Yes, Styles. Yes. Sir Buchan. No. Bozell? Yes. Sims? No. Reed? Yes. Okay. Uh, next item is Chapter 124608E6, Conditional Use. Oh, specific requirements. This is just a change in the table, Denise. Yes, it's adding um, short-term or adding transit guest lodging instead of we've you know short-term rentals, which we've had in the code since 2013, changing it to transit guest lodging in um, education inst institution district. Okay. 124602. Okay. Thanks. Any questions for Denise? I have it under 12, oh, 124602, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Just yes. making sure I was looking at the right yeah, thing. This is the Educational Institution District. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <coughs> okay, we'll open the public hearing. Do you want to add? No, that's my overall comment about the whole thing. The whole thing. So noted. Um, if not, then we'll close the public hearing. Any other questions? 
Chair, do you want to call the roll, please? We need a motion. Oh, we need a motion. I move approval of um, amending Chapter 1246.02 table. Second. Uh, Jerry so seconds. Okay. Sir Buchan. Yes. Styles. Yes. Sims. Yes. Kelzell. Yes. Reed. Yes. All right. The next change is the text amendment for t table 1248.02, schedule of uses for residential, as before. And. To be clear, I'm sure you know this, we're just making a recommendation to council. I understand. Okay. Thanks. And Not everyone does. And this is, again, changing short-term rental units, which was a conditional use in A, B, and C, to transient guest lodging in A, B, and C. Any questions for Denise? If not, we'll open the public hearing. No comments. We'll close the public hearing. Do we have a motion to accept these changes? So moved. Second. So, go with Snows on that one. Uh, Styles. Yes. Sims. Yes. Sir Buchan. Yes. Pozo. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, next one is the uh, table 125002 scheduled uses business district again modification to replace short-term rentals with transient guest lodging any questions for Denise? Mm -hmm. uh, if not we'll open the public hearing no questions we'll close the public hearing Do we have a motion to accept these changes so move second Sims. Yes. Mr. Buchan. Yes. Styles. Yes. Hillsdale. Yes. Reed. Yes. Uh, the next change is 1258.01, the table for schedule of uses by district, which is the summary table, and it replaces again short-term rental units with transient guest lodging. Any questions for Denise? Mm -hmm. If not, we'll open the public hearing. If there's no comments, we'll close the public hearing. Do we have a motion to accept these changes? I move approval. Second. All Sims. Sir Buchan. Yes. Ozell? Yes. Styles. Yes. Sims? Yes. Reed. Yes. And not quite last. Um, well, we have 128408, the definitions removing short term rentals. <laughs> Any questions for Denise? Yes. Uh, so, if there is a, a unit that's rented for more than 30 days, less than a year, if it's, if it's 30 days, even, it's not a conditional use. Less than 30 days. To the same time. If it's 30 days or more, it's just a rental. It's just a rental. We don't we don't regulate rentals. Okay. So the short term is bygone wording. Yeah. Right. The village doesn't regulate rental properties. We don't. So. Just the short term wording. <laughs> okay. Any other questions for Denise? Okay. If not, we'll open the public hearing. You want to put that on the record? Um, <laughs> we'll uh, close the public hearing. Uh, do we have a motion to accept the change in the, uh, or the striking of the definition of short-term rental? So moved. Second. Mm -hmm. Styles. Yes. Reed. Yes. Sims. Yes. Hozell. Yes. Sir Buchan. Yes. All right. Next one is the uh, definitions 1284.09, adding the definition of transient guest lodging. Any questions for Denise? If not, we'll open the public hearing. If there's no comment, we'll close the public hearing. We have a motion to accept this change in the definitions. So moved. Second. 
All right. Mr. Buchan? Yes. Stiles? Yes. Jose? Yes. Sims? Yes. Reed? Yes. Okay. So this is the last public hearing on our agenda. This is a discussion of Appendix B, which is recommended trees. Recommended. Denise, do you want to? So there was <clears throat> one section in the planning code um, for pocket neighborhood developments where we wanted to um, change to make sidewalks ADA compliant for any new, um, as a part of any new development, and which would include pocket neighborhoods. Um, and one of the uh, sections under the sidewalk requirements was uh, a link to Appendix B, um, which uh, Council Member Brian House wanted to look and see what that was. Um, it appears to be a Village of Yale Springs recommended tree list that I sent to him, and he said that a lot of those trees um, that needed to be updated, there was like still the caliper pear um, was on there that is now taken off the list. Um, so what I did um, was I um, looked at um, a street tree planning in Upper Arlington. Um, Brian House contacted Nick Budis with the Glen Helen Ecology Institute and shared that list with him. Um, I checked with um, a report by the YS Tree Committee um, for the streetscape, which was done in like 2012. And then I contacted um, <clears throat> Wendy Van Buren, uh, who works for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and she's their urban forester, and had her review the list. And the suggestions are what are underlined, um, strikeouts are what should be taken off the list. Um, as a result of a question by uh, Nick Budis regarding um, trying to use native trees as often as possible, um, Wendy suggested having like native and non-native having two categories there. Um, she also felt it would, was important to identify small, small trees, explaining what that was um, and the type of tree lawn width that they need in order to thrive. And so she also then split that, that out and had that definition as well. And then uh, one other suggestion at the end. So you have your, your small native and non-native, your medium native, non-native, and your large native, non-native. You have your trees not recommended for street use. And then um, one of the things that she suggested putting in there um, for removal of trees, which kind of came up, Nick was saying, well, in some cases you might not even want to have these trees. She called it a program to remove invasive species to protect the health of your mature trees. These are street trees, right? No. Just all street. All these, trees. The, it, oh, we, sh she's under, she's taking it as though it was street trees, but these, this can also be a guide for people who want to just plant trees in their yard, they can at least look at this list. Of, well, I would not recommend having a pawpaw next to this tree. <sighs> yeah. But it's okay. We can't keep it. So there's some editorial comments in here. Yes. Um, How are you going to handle those? Uh, I won't, well, I won't have those in there, obviously, when if you, if you pass this. <laughs> but one of the things is, like um, like Nick Budis was saying, that he thought uh, streets are more attractive when... Um, he, thought he, didn't, he did not agree with the statement that streets mm -hmm. are more attractive when they contain only one mm -hmm. kind of species. But um, Wendy Van Buren said, you know, um, when you're in a small community and you don't have an in-house arborist and trees have to be taken care of a certain way, Sometimes it's just a little bit easier to say on this street or this type of trees, and this is how you need to go out crew and put do, those. Do our crew, what what trees do does our crew trim? If for our for street trees, for our street trees, yeah, which is just downtown Yellow Springs, right? Well, no, I mean anything in the right of way. Oh. Huh. The village made takes well, trees. Well, if it's in electric lines and stuff like well, that. Well, yeah. Well, plus. It's really anything within the right way because of the alleys that we, you know, 
I didn't know that's that I mean, on they, village property. You're supposed to take care of your own trees. Right. If but, they don't, um, then the village will. And charge you for it. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you yeah, may not know. like the way they trim them, but that's for sure. <laughs> these are mostly, for, for the village's perspective, these are our street trees that the okay. village is yeah. maintaining. Um, probably downtown would be the bulk of them. Yeah. Yeah. So really what this is is just a list for folks to reference if they come to yeah. town and they want to plant some trees or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. It's guidance. But, you know, the one thing that was mentioned in there, which is true, like with the emerald ash borer, I mean, it just wiped out all the ash trees. So, you know, you have to think about that. When That's why you want diversity. The diversity of, yes. Okay, so really what you need from us then is um, uh, uh, us to agree to this so that you can take it to council and amend the, uh, the right. attachment mm -hmm. or appendix. If you think that that is better, I, I really thought her embellishment of the tree selection explaining their sort of long-term health of trees and mm -hmm. um, the 10, 20, 30 rule for community urban forests was helpful for people. Um, not only for us when planning a, this is for a guide for like developers in a, in a, sure. in a neighborhood, um, as, but as well as just for people on their own properties. Now are we just looking at attachment A and just attachment A, I think, because B is, it makes note. And then we have the uh, the old appendix B. Okay, this is the old appendix B. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're just looking at A right now, but we are going to be looking at B. Well, the B appendix B is the old. Is the, the old current? Okay, it's the right. current. Yeah. Okay, so A is yeah. the new. Yeah. And then attached with B is mixed note, and then C is the Upper Arlington. Right. Information. Okay. But the only. But the first three the pages are what apply. Okay. To okay. The change. So that okay. becomes the. New B. Okay. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. And attachment E is just Wendy said if you just don't want to have that huge of a list, you could. Uh, mm -hmm. She said she narrowed it down to this um, more focused set of uh, trees. Wait, there's appendix B and there's attachment B. Yes. This, this is what is One, now. One, two, three. This is the suggestion. Okay. This is what is now. Yeah. Attachment B is just Nick's discussion of what mm -hmm. he. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just supporting his that opinions. Right. So, do we need a public hearing? Uh, we do. But first, we need to have a discussion. Do we need. Is everyone okay with uh, replacing the. Uh, Old Appendix B? I think this is much more helpful. Yeah, it has a lot more information. Okay, I agree. And, but, Denise, you're going to clean this up before you take it to council. Yeah, um, yes. If you guys agree, I'll take out all these recommend little notes that I have here. Okay. The bold notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bold notes. Okay. Yeah, I'd say, like, pretty much just follow both of their recommendations. It doesn't seem like anything's really contradictory except for the um, multiple tree species. And I think, are, are we all on the same page about diversity being better than mono? Yeah, I'm not sure we're well enough organized to plan <laughs> same yeah, trees. No on one's, the block. Yeah, no one's planting right. a bunch of trees any like that. Right. Any other suggestions or discussion? Okay. Then well. I feel like things where, like, when you ask a question about one, well, why? Well, rather than answering that, it's in there. Let's we'll just leave it. Yeah. Um, there must Major have discussion. been a reason from the tree committee or some other. Where? What committee. are you talking about? Under trees not recommended for street use, birch. Um, she said she wanted to know why that was not recommended.
Yeah, I would say Ginkgo can stay there. I don't know. You can't, yeah. It looks like the ones that are not recommended have a lot of debris. Yeah. Right. So you're saying leave the ginkgo. <coughs> it's really, um, uh, tree is not recommended for street use. I would say ginkgo and I would add pawpaw. That's just my personal opinion. <laughs> I think she had pawpaw under. As, as yeah. recommended. Yeah, but not mm -hmm. for street use. So, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's the same as you'll say, George. I mean, yeah. you'll swerve around all those things, don't you? I mean, do you, I mean, <laughs> like, if you think ginkgos smell bad when they're rotting. <laughs> so, put, <laughs> like, a walk by a pawpaw tree that's um, dropping all their little. Oh, well, what if I just put, but not for street use. Well, ginkgo's a non-native recommended large tree. Right. But it's and a, it's in the tree is not recommended for street use. It's male versus the female. The male only. Male versus female. Yes. So if you look at it. But what I'm saying is like. Not recommended is ginkgo female. But you can't tell. You, you can't tell. I mean, just like a, a pawpaw isn't going to produce pawpaws unless there's a, 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 a fertile, you know. A so you suggest you just take it out both? No, I'm saying leave them, leave them both where they are, but add pawpaw to trees not recommended for street use. Like that they can be recommended as a tree because they're great and they're native, but they shouldn't be on the street. Thank you. That's fine. That's okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. They, well, they, they produce fruit. a lot of fruit if they bear fruit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, with those changes, are we okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then we'll open a public hearing on these. Like, I don't know why mulberry isn't recommended for street use. Is that because of their fruit? Must be. Mm -hmm. And they attract noisy birds. And there's no one else making comment. We'll close okay. the public hearing. Great. <laughs> that was my comment. Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to accept this change to Appendix B? So, so did you add uh, the only change that I've got is that you added paw paws to Correct. trees not recommended right. for street use right. outside of the changes to Denise's yes. right. Correct. Right. Correct. Second. And I'm sorry. Who's first thing on that? Siri. Me. Wait, Osage Orange isn't in the native large trees? Ah, oh, damn it. Whatever, they can change. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. And Stiles? Yes. Sir Buchan? Yes. Sims? Yes. Felzell? Yes. Reed? Yes. Osage Orange is not recommended. No, but for street use, but it's yes. not recommended for native okay, so large no. tree. Let's see. Which I would put it. Well, so, but since, um, since we don't have anyone right. going around <laughs> checking out the tree. They're just recommended rules, yeah. guidelines. I know. Yeah. Yeah. You can do everything you want. Do what you want. I want to, I want, if anything, I could plan the trees in Yellow Springs, guys. So Put this in front of me. Join the tree committee. Okay, so agenda so, planning, Denise? Yeah, so for agenda planning, um, we're not going to have the final plan phase one replat because we're waiting on Cresco and I found out today Cresco isn't going to be able to give an answer whether they're going to be ready in time they're just not going to be ready by October 9th and I have to advertise it tomorrow they're not even going to get a word to us until Friday so are you thinking of having a meeting later mm. like this um, month well I'll tell you, you I'll, leave, I'll leave it up to you because there's three things in the pipeline here. There's the Cresco site plan review conditional use. There's this final plan phase one replat, and there and the uh, fire station. They're coming to us too pretty soon, but they're not ready yet. Not by October, but possibly November, which would be a site plan review condition. But we do use. the two things for the Cresco at the same time, right? The replat and. Is that correct? Well, yeah. We, I mean, I'm saying we could have one meeting where all three of these things hit at once. 
Because see, the replat, no. the replat is the villages. It's a sep. It's it's going to be separate from the Cresco. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to do that until you have their plans in hand. Well, we don't want to do that until we have the Cresco figured out. So could we do the Cresco thing? They don't know if they're going to be ready at the end of October. Right. I won't know until Friday. So I can let everyone know. So yeah. if you tentatively want to say a date in October, but it has to be really towards the end. Otherwise, we just wait till November. You can wait till November. Let's just wait till November. And I really yeah, don't think we should have all three of those things on one. What What do you think, Matt? I agree with you, Rose. I don't, that's too much. Yeah. Um, and they're all pretty time sensitive, right? October 23rd is a fourth Monday in October. That's if they can do it. If they say on Friday they can do it by the 23rd, then my preference is that we do that okay and then if but if they can't and we end up having a meeting in november and we have all three coming to us uh in november do you want me to try to then communicate to you about having two meetings in november yes yes um, no repeat what what did you say if it, if they're not ready in, uh, for october 23rd then uh but they'll be ready in November, and it looks like by then the the um, fire station's going to be ready as well. Do you want to, me then to communicate about having two meetings in November? Yes. Well, then you got council, council, Thanksgiving. I yeah. mean, you you it's almost impossible to wish that stuff into November. Yeah. As but could we do it? Could we do a Monday night, night a Tuesday Monday. night? I mean, could we do a back to back Monday Tuesday? Like the November 13, 14. I don't know that that's any more palatable for. Well, I guess it wouldn't. I you just don't, don't, don't care. But. I mean, I don't. I don't want to have to rush through any of the. I, I mean, I just went back and looked at notes from Planning Commission. Gosh, there was one where we heard four conditional uses, which were all pretty darn extensive about food trucks, and I mean, that, those were all accomplished in one evening depends on how far sideways one is willing to sure. let anybody go yeah. but um and the two of them should be pretty straightforward shouldn't they? i mean uh, well, well depending, depending on be not a big deal well, i mean read everything ahead of time yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. but are people okay. going to come to the you know like the cisco what is it called cisco thing cresco no. cresco no. There might be a few people. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I there's have, only there's only okay, one had public a, hearing on the entire site plan. It's not like okay. they get to weigh in on whether they should have four trees or three. Yeah. We only open one public hearing for the entire shebang, and if you limit it, everyone to X amount of time, it should. I mean, I don't see it getting crazy at, okay. at all. Okay. And hey, what about the fire station? You're you know what more about this than I do. Yeah. I wouldn't think I've been wondering about that. I mean, I would I mean think it's that a would long night. There's no, don't get me yeah. wrong. As but far as some sirens, folks will live down there, I'm sure. Or, yeah. They'll have something to say about it. I, mean, I, just, I always have to work at 5 o'clock in the morning the next day. We've voted overwhelmingly. So I sympathize. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be, I think, I think, I think the, only, the only yeah. issues for anybody is going to be uh, light pollution and noise pollution. That's going to be it for all, in both of these projects. And perhaps yeah. in, in that case, then ask asking the legal department for a way in as to which conditions you are able to consider, which you are not for right. a fire station, right. Right? just to eliminate some of that. Well, from, you know, from the principal problem. Point, we saw no light pollution. Right. I think I think that I had one I had one concerned citizen that called because you know there already is light pollution from the street lights that are over there in that parking area for Antioch and so the question was is this just gonna now yeah. Yeah. more so but really that's yeah. more us. Yeah. When they show when there's yeah. The police or the fire station then would not be uh, able to present anything October? No. Okay. So that would they're not ready for October 9th. Okay, well, I think, but I mean, I don't know. I can check to see if they'd be ready October 23rd. I can check on that. Mm. If we have to do all of them in November, I think we can do that. The same day. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we'll go. Bang them out. Yeah, let's bang them out. I mean, can you have a meeting start earlier? Sure. We, we, sure. we can yes. just take a, a little break, can't we? Yes. Give us drinks. <laughs> well, could we, I mean, refreshments? Of course. If we could start <laughs> earlier, even like at, could we start six. at six? Yeah. I mean, we that still gives people a chance to get off work <laughs> and come if they want. Yeah. Yeah. We could meet at six. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right. you're saying on the 23rd at 6 o'clock? No. No, 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 no. We're looking at November. That's a possibility, though. But it's, we'll still consider that a possibility. November 13th? Or November 13th. At six. Starting at 6. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So there is no October meeting? October 23rd. Yeah. No, we don't know yes. that yet. Maybe we'll be doing just the Chris fire station or the fire station. We don't not, not probably well, we not the fire station, something. but That's probably something. neither of those things will happen in October. Okay. okay. Yeah, being that there is nothing left on our agenda, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye.